Grace and mercy from God the Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Pastor Rod here, and we want to welcome you to this virtual service on this 20, on the 17th day of June 2022, which is also Trinity Sunday. And on behalf of the churches of Ironsville and Flint Hill, we welcome you. And will you please join me in our opening prayer? Spirit of wisdom and hope, we witness your glory in the heavens and hear your call to us. We are sometimes overwhelmed by the thought of your compassionate care. Open our hearts to stay, to hear, and respond in joy to your call, that we may serve you faithfully all the days of our lives. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of John, and we're in the 16th chapter, reading verses 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever his, he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I think it's important for you to remember this through our lesson today that it spoke several times of he. And that he that he was referring to is the Holy Spirit. Today's message is going to be more of a teaching message than a preaching message, but I think it's a, a message that we all need to hear and understand. The past three Sundays we've been talking about an advocate in the form of the Holy Spirit being sent to us. Well, this advocate turns out to be a part of the Trinity, and today is Trinity Sunday. It can be really a complex task to explain the Trinity or Triune of God, can it? And if I were to ask you to explain the Trinity, what would you say? Well, we have the Godhead at the center of it all, from which comes God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three in one. Simple, right? Not really. I think we're all comfortable with talking about God, and I think we're really comfortable with talking about Jesus, but as someone commented to me last week, why do we shy away from talking about God the Holy Spirit? Can any of you give me a reason for that? Well, maybe the Holy Spirit is, in fact, very difficult to explain. It's something that we feel working inside us, but we can't really describe it. Perhaps we feel people may think we are a bit nuts if we admit our lives are guided by a spirit. And we just don't feel comfortable engaging in a conversation about that. Well, this morning, it's my hope that I can help you understand just what this advocate, the Holy Spirit, that was promised to us is about and what he will do for us. I'll address the following questions to help guide you in this quest and to better understand. First, we will address who is the Holy Spirit. Next is, what is the Holy Spirit's role in salvation? Followed by, what is the role of the Holy Spirit after our salvation? How can you respond to the Holy Spirit in your life? And finally, how do we apply that to our lives? Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, we established that the Holy Spirit is the third member in the Godhead of the Trinity. And he may be the most forgotten member of the Trinity. And so many times we refer to the Holy Spirit as a force or simply as an it. When you say it, that means you probably really don't understand what it is. Well, the Holy Spirit is not an it, but it is a person. In fact, the third person of the Trinity 
And many people feel that you have to wait for or catch the Holy Spirit. That's not true at all. That thought cannot be found in Scripture anywhere. You don't have to chase after the Holy Spirit in order to receive him. Author and theologian Wayne Grudem explains the Holy Spirit like this. The work of the Holy Spirit is manifest to the active presence of God in the world, and especially church. The Holy Spirit is the active presence of God in the world. Well, contrary to what you may believe, this Spirit is not only found in the New, is not only found in the New Testament. In fact, right in the beginning of the Bible and right at the beginning of creation, we find the Holy Spirit at work. In Genesis 1, verse 2, the second verse of the Bible, it says the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was hovering over the face of the waters. And we can find another example in 1 Samuel 16 and 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Just as we will find in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit empowers people for service. And he gave special revelation to the prophets as we find in 2 Peter 1.21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were centered or carried along by the Holy Spirit. That is all well and good, but what does that really have to do with us here and now in, this, in today's world? Well, we begin to find that answer in the next question. What is the Holy Spirit's role in our salvation? You see, the Holy Spirit is actually at work in you before your salvation, before you actually realize it. And John Wesley calls this prevenient grace. John 6.44 tells us that no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In other words, it is the me mentioned in this verse who is none other than the Holy Spirit that draws the unbeliever to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that does the initial work on your heart to bring you to Christ. The Holy Spirit softens your heart. It is the Holy Spirit that initially convicts the unbeliever. Jesus tells the disciple in John 16, 8, and when, he, and when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So an unbeliever, the first thing the Holy Spirit does for you is to convict you of your sins, showing you what you are doing is wrong and offensive, not only to others, but most especially to God. He then shows you there is no better way to live than the way you're living right now. That there is a better way to live than the way you're living right now. He brings you to a higher standard of righteousness in your life. And then he lets you know that you will have to answer to your sins and judgment one day. Now once you've convicted yourself, at that moment of conversion or being saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes this new believer into the family of Christ. And what do you think? When you hear the word baptize, you think of sprinkling water or maybe even dunking someone in the river. But in this context, it is a fancy word meaning to immerse. So what this means is when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, it means he places you or fully immerses the new believer into the family of the body of Christ. So when you get saved, one of the things that God gives you is a new family. Our brothers and sisters in Christ that become your new extended family with whom you fellowship and with that family with which God adopted you into. For one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves are free, and we all were made to drink of one spirit. First Corinthians 12, 13 is where that came from. And then we have Romans 8, 15, which tells us this. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see, you and I can now cry out to our Father in heaven in prayer because the Holy Spirit has placed us into the family of Christ. That means we have total access to God for everything that we need. That being said, as someone newly saved or, 
or being in a new conversion, the Holy Spirit also permanently indwells every believer with his presence. The Holy Spirit lives within you, and you cannot lose this. 1 Corinthians 3.16 tells us, You are God's temple, and God's Spirit dwells in you. The Holy Spirit is given to you at conversion, and there is nothing you can nothing you can or need to do to receive him. It is automatic when you become a Christian. Since you are now in God's temple, you have a new nature, one that no longer lives in sin or desires to live in sin. You have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to overcome the power of sin. Let's look at John 14, 15, and 17. It says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you. He dwells in you and will be in you. What he's saying is to you is, I'm here for you. Here's how you can reach me. Just call out to me. I'm in touch. I'm within reach. Can you hear me now? And that's the question of the era, the question of the church today. Can you hear him, hear the truth, hear his voice, the Holy Spirit, and know that you are not alone? At the very moment that you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit seals you as a believer. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. To be sealed speaks to ownership and protection. When a king will put a seal on something, it means that this thing belongs to the king and needs to be protected. And once you become a believer, you are given the protection of God, your king, because you are now his and his family. The Holy Spirit also gives the new believer a new life. John 3, 5 and 6 says this, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Whatever wrongs you did before you came to know Christ has been buried under the cross. You no longer have to carry that guilt and shame. Amen? That brings us to what the role of the Holy Spirit is after our salvation. Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit convicts the believer of his sin. And there are those things that we didn't care about before because we suddenly began to feel bad about these things. We... We feel guilty for doing these things. We feel sorry for doing these things. And David described the power of the Holy Spirit with his conviction in Psalms 51, 3 and 4. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. This was written to express how David felt after committing adultery. And it came on the heels of being convicted by the Holy Spirit of his wrongdoing. He truly felt remorse and repented. The Holy Spirit also empowers believers for service. We wrote about this two weeks ago in Acts 1.8. But it, it says, but let me remind you, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. You will receive power and be of my service to me by sharing the good news with others. The Holy Spirit will help us do things such as witnessing or anything else in the way of serving him that we would not be able to accomplish on our own. Acts 6 describes Stephen, who was a wise man, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, full of grace and power, who was doing great things and signs among the people. And then the Holy Spirit fills the believer. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it says that in Ephesians that you begin addressing one another in psalms of and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything 
to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You're now engaging as a believer in fellowship with other believers. And understand this, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit makes him a resident. But filling of the Holy Spirit makes him the president. When you first get saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within you, which is the indwelling which we spoke about earlier, and it begins to mold you into becoming a Christian. But the mature Christian, to the mature Christian, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he is not the resident. He is the president, which means he is not only in you, but he is now guiding and controlling everything that you do. The filling of the Spirit is not about asking God for more of the Spirit, but it is for allowing God's Spirit to have more of you. Amen? And from that, we receive a Spirit-filled life full of the fruits of the Spirit as we read about in Galatians 5, 23, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And when you can truly feel those things within you, and when others see those fruits in how you live your lives day to day, you can be sure that you are indeed filled with the Holy Spirit. In the life of the believer, the Holy Spirit teaches and reminds us. We learned this in each of the past two Sundays during the Ascension of Christ and the day of Pentecost. We read John 14, 26, that, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. This is called the illumination ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you may ex have experienced that when you're reading a, your Bible and, and the truth jumps off of the pages at you, slaps you across the face and says, hey, this is meant for you today. That is nothing less than the Holy Spirit illuminating the word of God for you. The Bible tells us that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God wants his word to come alive to you so that things will be brought to you that are pertinent in what's going on in your life or through that particular time in your life. Have any of you been faced with a problem or concern and then out of nowhere a scripture is presented to you either in your daily devotion or, or maybe even a meme that you come across on the internet? That, my friends, is the Holy Spirit at work in you and for you. The Word of God is alive and powerful. And he both teaches and reminds you of what Jesus taught us through the word. That is why it's important to read your Bible daily so that the Holy Spirit will teach and remind you of God's truth. So that in every situation and in every temptation and every decision, you will have God's perspective and not the world's perspective. This will help you do what God wants you to do. 1 John 2.27, you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything that you need to know. And he teaches, and what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. With this knowledge provided by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit guides the believer. For today's gospel reading, we find in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own but he will tell you what he has heard, and he will tell you about the future. He will give you insight about everything that is about to happen in your life so that you can discern which path to take in any given situation. He guides you through your situations and provides you with wisdom and discernment. The Holy Spirit assures the believer of salvation, and that should be comforting thought to everyone here, and I pray that it is. Have you ever asked yourself or wondered if you're truly saved? I know I have at times. So I know I am now, but I at times in the past have wondered that. We find this reassurance in Romans 8.16. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And the Holy Spirit convicts you, reminds you of scripture, 
empowers you to do something that you would not normally do outside of your fleshly state, gives you the power to resist temptation, teaches you a biblical truth. That, my friends, is God's witness to you that you are his child. And it doesn't get any better than that, does it? Amen? What an awesome gift. If you sense any activity of the Holy Spirit working within you, then you could be assured that you are a child of God and you never, never, ever have to question your salvation. Finally, the Holy Spirit helps us pray. This is simply stated in Romans 8.26. And when the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness, for example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. The Holy Spirit prays for you. There are times in our lives we just don't know the words to use in our prayers. God knows what is in your heart, and it's during those times that the Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Now, how do you properly respond to the Holy Spirit's presence in your life? How does this all apply to us? By walking by the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, 16 and 21. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are under the obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, nature the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impure, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. When you are in the flesh, you're not walking in the spirit. But when you walk in the spirit, you will not want to live out the desires of the flesh any longer. Do you feel the Holy Spirit in you? If not, perhaps you cannot sense God's presence in your life because of the darkness of sin, the shadows of worry and anxiety, the shades of suffering and death, and the awful problems of disease and suffering. We need to remember that God came into the world in the presence of the Holy Spirit to provide a constant source of courage and strength and guidance for us all. The Holy Spirit is all-powerful, all-wise, and everywhere present. So stop relying on yourself and rely on the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as your child in Jesus, we desire to be totally an instrument for your kingdom to manifest through our lives. I desire to receive your promise of the Holy Spirit as a believer in you. Jesus, our Savior and King, baptizes us in the Holy Spirit so that the power of your resurrection will work in us and transform us according to your will. Holy Spirit, empower us and fill us to overflowing. We hold nothing back from you. Work your gifts in us and through us, all of us being, so that the Father's kingdom may be manifested in and through our lives. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Go in peace, dear one. Go with the knowledge that God the Father, Jesus, God's Son, and the Holy Spirit are with you. Bring peace to all that you meet. Amen. Have a blessed week.